if we're thinking about the cybersecurity threat landscape at the moment, there are three broad categories of threats I would consider. One is the industry scale organized cybercrime, which is exactly what I said. It is organized, it has become an industry in its own right, it's highly professional and very quickly evolving. Then the second category would be the hostile states seeking to convert their cyber power into political, occasionally economic influence. And then there's technology itself, it's still an imperfect tool with vulnerabilities that are being discovered, old software that is not really developed to today's security standards, new technologies that we don't really even know yet what the risk implication and vulnerabilities and threat vectors would be. So it's a rather complex ecosystem. And for the threat actors, you see as well how the different actors are triggered by different things. Of course, for criminal actors, the main motive is financial gain, the money. So the pattern of activity is based on making quick gains and moving on. Now, the state-sponsored and state-conducted cyber operations, the story is rather different. For one thing, their objective is to remain stealthy, remain below the radar, remain in the systems for a longer period collect information about the infrastructure itself, its vulnerabilities, its users, the data and information processed within those systems, and then wait for the opportune moment, whether that was sabotaging the system or simply using the information drawn through the espionage operation is oftentimes a rather opportunistic game. If we consider the state-sponsored threats, then of course for the Western Alliance, for NATO and Western uh, democracies, the two, three most important adversarial actors are Russia and China, and then also North Korea. So considering Russia, the issue of Russian sponsored cyber attacks rose to the public attention with the 2007 cyber attacks against Estonia, which was at the time very new to the world at large. In essence, the attacks were not very complicated. It was denial of service attacks, as the professional term goes, which means that the public online resources, state organizations of financial institutions of media organizations, were simply flooded with excessive malicious traffic until they became unresponsive. But this highlighted the realization of the potential that cyber attacks could have on how a society functions. And we call this a wake-up call. NATO endorsed its first cyber defense policy a few months after those events in Estonia. But for the majority of the world, I think the wake-up call with the events in Ukraine in 2014, and the pattern was fairly similar. Cyber operations supporting kinetic operations by the same old uh, denial of service attacks, using online venues and outlets for propaganda, disrupting the website of the Ukraine Electorate Commission where the initial results were to be shown. So it has been an evolution. The skills and the resources available have grown, but we recognize many of the same activities. Russia does not mind breaking rules and having the publicity for that. It is not that keen on remaining below the radar. It's almost like Russia doesn't seem to mind getting caught conducting malicious cyber activities. It's rather considering as a credit to its capabilities. One could even describe it as loud and dirty. China, on the other hand, has been evolving quietly, slowly and very persistently and strategically over time, developing its own technological and digital capabilities. It's become a really significant technological player China has relied over the years far more on uh, industrial uh, espionage than Russia ever has seemed to. Chinese specialization has been towards using cyber for economic purposes and Russia has used cyber capabilities rather for its political objectives. And of course, at the end of the day, even with economic power, as we see with China, how it is relying on this as a tool of political power. But Russia has been perhaps more direct and more blunt in doing so. You often hear the question, what is the point in shaming somebody that cannot be ashamed? And there are several reasons for this. One is that by attributing malicious cyber activity to the perpetrator, you're signaling that the rules recognized in international law do apply to cyberspace, so that this is not a lawless game, this is not a ruleless game. International law applies to state conduct in cyberspace as it does in the traditional spheres of state activity. Uh, secondly, also signaling that you have noticed the actor uh, breaching those rules. And states have also published some of the evidence leading to that decision. So it's also a way of signaling not only that we notice how you are doing this, 
but we also know what your methods and means are and we are going to tell the entire world, depriving the malicious actor of the chance to use the same methods in its crime. And then, of course, attribution is also a prerequisite for a state taking any steps in response. So yes, it is important to signal and use attribution as a means to hold those accountable that have breached the international norms. The question of whether NATO has been effective in deterring cyber attacks and responding to cyber attacks is one to which there is no straightforward answer. On the one hand, the test of deterrence is fairly clear. It is a deterrent if it deters. So if the other party continues carrying out cyber attacks, then it doesn't seem fully effective. But there is also good merit to be careful not to destabilize cyberspace and undermine the security of the common infrastructure we all run on. So on the one hand, say that NATO's deterrence has not uh, always been convincing, but on the other hand, I would also say that there are good reasons for it. And NATO has demonstrated a lot of restraint in responses and held to its commitment to be a defensive alliance rather than anything else. The NATO cyber policy has, from the very beginning, relied on two pillars. One is the defense of NATO's own systems, and the other one is strengthening the resilience of its allied members and the responsibilities of the NATO allies. They are also twofold. So one is definitely the Article 5 applying in cyberspace. An armed attack against one member of the alliance is considered as an armed attack against them all. And hence, all the allies commit to individually and collectively come to the aid of that nation. And the question of whether Article 5 is relevant at all to a cyber attack was something that was hotly debated in NATO, but the conclusion was very unanimous that it doesn't matter that an attack is conducted by cyber means if the impact is equivalent to that of a traditional kinetic armed attack. What has been less spoken about is the commitment to Article 3, which is improving the resilience and the defense capabilities of all the members by themselves. Without a doubt, U.S. is the largest and the most capable member of the NATO alliance, even by its share size. So, of course, the United States' role and its weight and voice encourage NATO allies to keep up their part in investing into their national resilience and national cyber defenses is very, very important. And here, NATO allies have, over the years, invested rather significantly into their own resilience, into their own defense. In 2016, NATO allies adopted the Cyber Defense Pledge and they have also all made good progress in this. Then if you think about the NATO allies that are also uh, member states of the European Union, the EU member states adopted a rather landmark document in 2016. Based on that, they have improved the resilience of their critical infrastructure. They have invested into creating EU-wide cooperation networks to be able to act in a speedier, more effective, and more informed manner in case a major malware campaign or threat campaign is evolving. So there is actually a whole lot that has been done already, uh, especially when we are looking at the European side of the Atlantic. The old metaphor that the chain is only as strong as its weakest link also means that all the links in this chain have to remain connected to each other for the chain to function. So you can't really pull out any of the partners and expect it to work the same way or be as credible as in a situation where all those links are fully functional and collaborate and trust each other. I don't think NATO is lacking in resources or competence or expertise, but what we need as an alliance is a commitment to work together and we need a resolve that we will cover each other's backs so that we we'll stay true to uh, the commitment that was expressed in the founding treaty of the North Atlantic Alliance. It's no more complicated than that. Everything else can be and, and actually is being worked out. Partnerships are critical in cyber, more critical perhaps than in many other domains. But partnerships do not form in cyber in isolation. So they are a product of the overall political, economic, diplomatic collaboration between countries. So we cannot really operate on... Uh, we are doing well in regard to our relations in the cyber domain, so we should be happy. We need to invest to building and maintaining the trust between our allies and nations. And that has its benefits to how well we do in terms of our resilience to cyber threats. There is a very clear set of democratic values and principles that the EU, by its very nature, operates by. 
over the past decade or so, we have seen actors and countries taking advantage of those rather than operating by the same playbook as we do. But then you obviously have a choice. Whether you turn dirty yourself, you turn your back to your uh, values of principles and gain in terms of power, but lose your identity. And, and there, I see Europe has still made a very clear choice to uh, remain true to its identity. But of course, we are not ignorant to the fact that our ideal of the game doesn't necessarily match the view of the game for many other countries that we need to interact with. Principled openness has also opened the door for autocratic regimes to establish a foothold here. The same things that allow for conducting business securely and confidentially also allow for criminal actors conducting their business securely and confidentially. Contrary to popular belief, cyberspace is not a lawless space. International law applies to state conduct regardless of the means. The UN Charter applies to state conduct in cyberspace as it has since its inception. That's something that has not changed simply because technology has evolved. So it is critical that we uphold this commitment to respect and strengthen international law, and not just by our words, but our conduct as well. Coming from a small state, we have often said that the rules-based international order is the most critical security guarantee for small nations. And let's face it, most of the world's countries are small nations. So it is critically important for the majority of the world that all players play by the rules, they respect the rules and respect each other. The short-run perspective is oftentimes a bit discouraging, but in the long run, I've seen these democratic principles being more sustainable and more resilient. It's far less efficient, but against disruptions, against insecurity, democratic societies are equipped to deal with that. If you think about the vulnerable cyber landscape, one thing we need to understand about technology is that it is not perfect. We have placed an incredible lot of trust and have relied on solutions that are fundamentally imperfect. They are created by humans prone to error, even without any malicious intent. We cannot expect that the fundamental infrastructure will ever become secure by essence. Much like an ecosystem, much like a human body, it is something that is constantly subjected to various kinds of impact from the outside. And we have to get rid of this binary thinking that technology can be either secure or insecure. Accepting that we will always have to deal with an insecure environment and we have to constantly keep up our work to secure our systems to make sure that we are able to prevent successful cyber attacks, that we are able to recognize and detect intrusions as they occur, that we need to be able to mitigate, learn from the, such things and then move on. In essence, we have to become, uh, uh, rather than secure or unsecure, we have to uh, have this mindset of resilience.